Fancy a brewing tosh? All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. 25 years of ups and downs with Roller Coaster Tycoon. Don't fix it, 3D print it. Did I just see what I think I saw? It was Johnny. All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Good morning, Neil. How are you? Good morning, Dave. I'm well, a little groggy, a little tired, um, as I am every week, because uh, we had sessions Saturday and Sunday in the cave. Saturday, normal session. Sunday, we were supporting Young Gloucestershire, which is a charity that helps out uh, young, I'd say young adults and teenagers um, in the area just to help them find their confidence, work out what they want to do with their life. Uh, support them mm. in in lots and lots of ways. So it was nice to do a little bit of, um, I guess, community. What would you call it? Outreach. Community outreach. Yeah. yeah. So they had a little session, and they all seemed to have a good time. And lots of leaflets were taken. So maybe we'll see some of them again at the museum. Good. So um, tired, but but good. Um, I've also spent last week, some of last week, making the physical shop in the cave into a virtual shop, so you can route you can virtually come to the museum shop oh. um and look at our books oh did you like that dave you made a sound like you like yeah that. no i didn't see it i saw you i saw it coming out so i'll need to watch that then forgot all about it oh okay um yeah so if you go to rmcretro.store you can browse the shop all the books that i've got all the stickers all the mugs um i re- the the last few re- remaining retro tea breaks books because i am down to the last uh, lot from the original kickstart run um to, to sell um and vinyl hoffman vinyl and this week in retro mugs a this week in retro mug has been made yes yeah so if you want to drink from the official mug of the show while listening to the show go to uh, rmcretro.store and um have a look and there's also a link there over to the retro collective store which is where he will sell their uh cool retro electronics products which is well worth a browse more and more they're bringing on stream so have a look there too um that's what i've been up to dave all all sounds like business as usual um which is it's kind of how my life is the 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 job that i have i mean i'm so i'm uh, it's a cliched word i'm so blessed dave to do what i do that um work is life and life is work but that's okay because it's such a fun thing hmm you know, I don't want to turn into Mr. Boring talk about work all the time, but I've got a pretty cool job. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah. I have been looking at something that I want to buy. Um, a few months ago, Techmoan, um, surely everybody knows who Techmoan is, a wonderful YouTube channel, uh, grumpy guy who's not actually that grumpy, really. Um, he reviewed this mini pin, pinball table, as many virtual pinball tables. So it's a... Uh, just an LCD screen, screen sunk into this cabinet from At Games, and he's just put out a video a few days ago for the the full size one, which I think is a fifty inch um, monitor inside there. Uh, the At Games Pinball Four K. I've had my eye on virtual pinball tables for a long time, so I've wanted a pinball table. There is zero chance I would ever have a real pinball table because of the maintenance involved and the size of them. This seems to be a little bit smaller. And I'm looking at thinking, I want it. It's over £2,000, but I want it. And for what it is, I think it's reasonable value. There's a little bit of a lag problem with it, so I'm not getting it now. It comes as the Adams Family, which is one of my favourite pinball tables from the 90s. So there's the Ad... Sorry, Neil? Oh, so it's a recreation of the actual original Adams Family. Yes, a recreation of the the, the original Adams Family, but... It's got that that artwork on the side, but also it'll do other tables as well. But that's the kind of that's the the the, the table that it does. It's like having a, it's like having your Gallagher thing with a a, 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 a Mister inside, so you can choose different things. But having it boot up to Gallagher and but, a flat screen, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, but the flat. He, he says that, that there's there's actuators inside it, and it's convincing enough so that once you're playing it, you forget it's it's virtual. The thing is. Um... It's a bit of a different case when it comes to pinball. If you're if you're using virtual pinball, 
you are doing it to avoid exactly what you said, all the maintenance, all the wear and tear. You want to enjoy the pinball experience uh, at a level above what you enjoyed perhaps when you were play playing Pinball Dreams or one of those other yes. ones on your monitor. You want to take it a, a step further without going into the realms of physically owning it. So, well, I, um, I used I used to have virtual pen meme, and I used to turn my monitor around yeah. and set yeah. it and set it at an angle. So I, I was I was into it back then, but I've had a little bit of a and in a health encouragement to lose weight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I think, set myself a weight loss goal, and if I hit it, I'll buy the pinball table. I think <laughs> that's, that's a, a way to motivate myself to do it. <laughs> do we need like a, a weekly uh, chart that appears in the show or something, well, Dave's counter. Maybe because that, that might keep me honest. <laughs> right. Have a think about it. If we can yeah. help you, Dave, we'll, we'll help you through the show, and I'm sure all the listeners will be on board with that. Good. Um, any anything else? I mean, do you? I, I remember watching Lee's series on more fun making. Yes, like yes. He built a virtual pinball table. No inclination to build your own. If time, if I had all the time in the world, I would definitely do it. But mm. I don't, and I realised more and more, I've become a janitor in my own house, trying to keep maintenance up on things, trying to get things working. I've got too many projects on the go, and. While it might seem like a reward to get this to 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 design it all, I, I don't, I can't do woodwork. No, I, I would never get it done. It would just be at the end of a long list. If I get this, it's for what you get. It's an excellent thing. Do you not fear that you will fall into that trap that you do with other things, whereby you might buy it and then you'll immediately be looking at the community upgrades and add-ons and improvements and things to add on to this thing? Or do you think I'm not you can sure just install it and be satisfied? I'm not sure what more what more it could get other than replacing the guts and adding AI kind of eye recognition stuff to it and so on. The two thousand pound version of it comes with great big subwoofer and actuator speakers and all the rest of it i think it's pretty complete i think i'd be okay with it as it is okay well there's your reward have a think about how you're going to get there and if yeah we can help you do yeah it. just over the last day i've been thinking about it yes. shall we go on with the stories let's do it let's go into the first story which i believe is yours i can't say i'm a boy's own fan but ronan keating had a bit of insight when he said, life is a roller coaster. I can't remember the lyrics, but I assumed he must have been talking about Bullfrog Classic Game Theme Park. He is one of the great philosophers of our time. Well, thanks to a submission from Christ of Why Do You, I've been reading a Guardian article about Roller Tycoon, Roller Coaster Tycoon, and maybe that's what he means instead. Roller Coaster Tycoon is a 1999 game that started a series of sequels, and eventually they seem to have uh, gone on to uh, mobile-focused things. Uh, not that I've played any of them. Uh, and they're made by Chris Sawyer. Now, Chris Sawyer is a giant in the games industry. He's, of course, Scottish, which probably explains at least part of why he's so great. Uh, he's worked on a number of games and ports of games before he made his first game, Transport Tycoon, a game which is still being played by many people, and there's now the Open TTD, now Open Tri Transport Tycoon Deluxe, which I think he grumbles about getting no money from. <laughs> um, but that's the, the version to play. Um, and it turns out that when he made Transport Tycoon, the money he made from it took him around Europe, and he got to ride on lots of roller coasters, which gave him the inspiration for this game. And you can certainly see the, the heritage from Transport Tycoon in this game. Now, I want to talk about it's 25 years old, which is why we're talking about it now. But I want to talk about how this genre of game in general and why I think it's so captivating. Now, Sim City, that I think, is the first one that maybe everyone thinks of, the first one that came out in this kind of do what you like, create something nice and calm and peaceful and no real end in sight. Um, and I think that's that's the first one that everyone thinks of, but the genre is absolutely huge now. It's never went away since SimCity started. Loads of games are doing the same kind of sandbox or sandbox with limits or objectives type thing. Steam is absolutely cluttered with them. Uh, there are very many cookie cutter ones with just a a slight change in theme um and they're not very innovative they're just all copies of each other uh and i once fell into the trap of playing a mobile game i can't remember the name of but it was very cleverly designed to get you logging in once a day 
It would time you out in building things for a few hours that you'd have to come back and then build and expand. And it's clear the goal was to get you to pay a micro transaction to bypass the limits. Now, I didn't pay anything for it. I probably out of stubbornness decided I'm not going to pay anything. I'm still going to do it. And I was even getting it. I was even allowing notifications so that it would make me log back in to do something. Uh, but I found out eventually that the game just stopped. There was nothing else to do. It was as if it was incomplete and they decided that beyond this point, they've either got all the money you're going to give them or you're not going to give them any money. But it was, it was a cynical thing. It wasn't a very good game. It was just there to get you to pay for it. But going back to these, the first one I played was SimCity on the Atari ST, but the one that sucked me in the most was Railroad Tycoon. Do we actually conflate city building games with tycoon games? Are they in the same genre? I think they're slightly separate. I think SimCity is the first game in this wider genre that was the big one. Sandboxing, do you think? Yes, sandbox creation game, building your own thing. So SimCity is different than Transport Tycoon. Hmm. And Theme Park, if you want to say Theme Park, I mentioned earlier on from Bullfrog, Theme Park and SimCity are not the same type of game. No. But this game, um, Railroad, Railroad? Yeah, Railroad Tycoon, Transport Tycoon, yes. Roller Coaster Tycoon. There's a yes. lineage there, yeah. Yes. But SimCity and then SimCity 2000 and SimCity 3000, where you're building transport links, you're putting infrastructure in, there's much more similarities by the time you get further down the genre. And it's it's the same kind of idea. The stu- the, you're doing the same kind of activity. You're sitting at your computer at your own pace, building things, trying to get them to run just right and trying to get the, the population happy. Do you see where I'm going? Have I made the point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. I get you. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was, as I said, SimCity and the Atari ST. It did come out around the same time that I had the CPC, but I never played it that way, thankfully. It did run in a CPC, but it wasn't very enjoyable to play. Um, and then Railroad Tycoon, which I put enormous amounts of time into, that's, of course, Sid Meier, though. It's not uh, Chris Sawyer. But Transport Tycoon was Chris Sawyer, and they're not related other than the name and being published by Microprose. But I do wonder if Microprose had any kind of guiding hand in them. I'm thinking that I know that Microprose had a guiding hand in Laser Squad uh, 2 turning into UFO, mm. uh, XCOM UFO. XCOM, yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe they, they guided Chris Sawyer into what to make there. I'm not sure. But as for Railroad Tycoon, by the time it came out, I'd moved on from the genre mostly. I did play it, though, but not for too long because I was playing online games then. But I think the market for these is so heavily saturated that any time I fancy playing one of these, I'll just reach for Open TTD because it does what I wanted to do uh, every few years when I want to go through it. So, Neil, did you ever play this? Well, um, thank you, Dave, for reminding me of the Ronan Keating song which is um, a bit of a running joke in our house because it is such an annoying earworm. I don't know if you agree with me on that, but it is very annoying to the point where my wife Lily and I often just quietly whisper or in passing say a line of the song to each other just (laughs) to annoy each other because several hours later I'll get a message from her saying, for God's sake, why am I singing this stupid song? You just ronined me, as we call it. So you ronined me today, Dave. Um, You will be singing it later now. (laughs) <laughs> Roller Coaster Tycoon is an insane game because it was famously written entirely in assembly, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's yep. why it's such a slick experience. It squeezed every ounce of power out of our machines. And I know that I appreciated that. You know, you're, you're spending a lot of money on PCs at this point if you're um, in the PC world and not a console, console owner. You're putting. Um, Usually, usually at least a thousand pounds. You can you can get under the thousand pound mark, but it was at least a thousand normally when you've had a monitor put on top of it and all the rest of it. Dave, yeah, and this is nineteen ninety nine, so this is well into the era where you had things like D three D APIs, where you could mm. write things at a fairly high level, which led to this the kind of I'm going to say bloat that we have now in games, but I'm going to. I'm going to caveat that by saying we couldn't do the games we have now in Assembly because they're so vastly complicated. 
So th- th- this is him doing something that y- you you barely were able to do in 1999. You certainly couldn't do now. Yeah, it go. You know, it goes back to the eight bit era of games where it demanded that. Uh, type of programming to get the most out of the system it the systems didn't demand that at this point you had apis no. like you say and there was a balance to be found between rapid development focusing on the gameplay elements and programming um you know apis could um release you a little bit free you up a little bit is api the right word have i have i have i used the wrong term no api is the right word so is you okay? yeah you you would program in whatever you want to program in c for example and then you could call functions from the api which are pre-programmed chunks of code um in the case of DirectX, that uh, offer a layer of separation from the hardware because there's so many different types of graphics cards for example it allows you to just say i want to draw a sphere on the screen at this point and regardless of what graphics card you've got it'll do it for you and you know that's good for a programmer and at this point where we've got so much power that's fine you can just chuck that around you don't have to worry about assembly language but in 1999 it was um unusual to do it but it was appreciated it really was appreciated because it made the game flow i mean imagine roller coaster tycoon with that awful frame rate and things just sort of chugging yeah. along and thinking no we didn't have any of that it was a beautifully written game so um appreciated that i think from some of the things you said, I think I might have been in a similar place to you in 1999 when Roller Coaster Tycoon came out because I'd been utterly addicted to these games. Railroad Tycoon um, that came out in 1990 and that combined train sets with cutthroat business and, and the excitement of bookkeeping. Yes, believe it or not, that is a fun thing to do in these games. <laughs> Balance the books, set the taxes, set the ticket prices, all the rest of it. When you think about it, it was a much cooler version of Tea Shop, which um, in the USA is Lemonade Stand. You know, it, these these games go back even further to that kind of thing. So out of Railroad Tycoon, I got hooked on SimCity, SimCity 2000, slightly different genre as we discussed, theme park. Sim Farm, I enjoyed that. Transport Tycoon, Theme Hospital. There were hundreds of them. So by the time Roller Coaster Tycoon came out in 99, the year of Unreal Tournament, I have to admit, I was a bit tycooned up to the eyeballs. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. you're nodding there, Dave. It was a, we were all a bit tycooned out. Yeah, the, the, those kind of strategy games that came out then, um, they 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 were amazing, and you couldn't really do them until you got this uh, until the end of the sixteen bit era and, uh, era, and then PC allowed it to go much further. And I sh- I think both of us just filled our boots with them to the point of okay, I'm done with this now. Yeah. Even, you know, a, a tenuous link back to games like Populous in the late 80s we were playing. You know, there are some in in its sandbox elements more than its business well, you can management. See how, you can see how they went from Populous to um, Theme Park. Hmm. The, 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 a little bit of a link there. And then from Theme Park, you you, you can get to this. And you can get, you get across the SimCity 3000, but you can't go from Populous to this. Via Dungeon Keeper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's in there too, isn't it? We're going down the bullfrog route and, uh, yeah, real-time management of um, imps yeah. and devils. <laughs> uh, I think when the nostalgia set back in for me, that's when I visited Transport Tycoon or Open TCD, Transport Tycoon, Tycoon Deluxe. Um, it holds up well. I dip back in and out, and it's nice to play it on a modern monitor with a greater resolution and all the rest of it. But it is with these with games, it's quite easy sometimes when you played them so much and when you know them so well to get yourself into a, what I call a no lose scenario where you've met the uh, the criteria to just have money coming in. You've just you've just got everything set up, all your bus stops, all your train stations are working. Money is just pouring in. You can build what you want where you want until you fill the map up. But that's fine. That's the way I like to play them. I think I, I, I like to play them where they're, the difficulty is light so that all you need to do is be reasonably credible in what you're doing to keep the money coming in rather than an actual challenge to get through a scenario. And I, th- I think, I think, and people can correct me, that most people like to play it in that kind of open sand world way where the, the, the focus is on what can you build rather than can you run a successful bus company. 
Yeah. It's still a little bit frustrating, though, because I, I get to a point where I love that full sandbox, unlimited money experience, and then you realize the challenge is gone. But you can just start a new game, turn the difficulty up. Um, that's all good. As a, an, another aside, I did interview Chris Sawyer. Um, it's an exclusive chapter in my Retro Tea Breaks book. And do you know where you can buy that, Dave? No. Where can you buy it, Neil? You can buy that at rmcretro.store, where I've got about eight copies left. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, Neil, this goes out on Saturday, so they'll probably will be sold no. out by then. So you no, can no, the sales aren't that quick. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the article linked in the show notes is worth, uh, it's a quick read. Uh, it's interesting. I haven't spoiled all of it. I try not to spoil all of the articles so you get something to read. So have a read of it. Dave, I went to buy a magazine the other day. Can I tell you about my experience? Yeah, how was it for yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> you sound like my therapist now, Dave. How was it for you? How did that make you feel? Well, it didn't make me feel great, to be honest, because uh, we've all got these wonderful nostalgic memories about how important magazines were in our experience with retro computers. And I thought, I haven't done it for a while. I'm going to drive into Swindon. I'm going to pay to park at a multi-story car park. I'm going to go to W8 Smith, and I'm going to buy a magazine. And it's not the magazine that is our sponsor. It's another well-known retro magazine. And it wasn't there. Great big W8 Smith, it wasn't there. Uh, the lights were dingy. The carpet was horrible. I was even going to treat myself to a coffee. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to go home. This is this is not the trip I envisaged. I went home. I went to pixel.addict.media. And instead, I bought the latest copy of Pixel Addict. So um, it's a little story, a little cautionary tale to you, Dave, to um, not bother going into Swindon Town Centre. <laughs> <laughs> just buy just buy Pixel Addict instead at pixel.addict.media. <laughs> um, they have told us that they have a new thing that they've been asked for for, for a long time. I think it was technically difficult for them to achieve you can now take a renewing subscription you had to buy it in batches you'd have to buy like 12 issues at a time or one issue at a time you can now subscribe to it properly on the, the same issue yeah all the same issue the yeah, other yeah. yeah 12 of this one please no you would buy 12 sequential months i see um, six weekly but now you can buy a subscription that renews every uh, periodically um so go and do that now and tell them we sent you oh that was a bit threatening dave <laughs> yeah i'm threatening people that i'm not of course <laughs> just shake different. them down to buy pixel addict it's entirely optional you don't have to do it you don't have to <laughs> where, where do they not have to go pixel.addict.media Superb. Dave, you wouldn't download a car, but would you download and 3D print your own retro computer? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes? Of Easy course. Answer. Easy answer. I think we all would if we had the capability. Um, and exactly the kind of thing I would expect a Scottish piracy man to say. Pirating physical computers. I don't know. Whatever next. <laughs> Kevin Noki or Noki over on YouTube has released a video this week, which was shared on our subreddit by Raider of Awesome. So thank you for that. He's made a full sized, fully functional 3D printed Apple Macintosh, and it looks great. Clocking in at just under 50 minutes, this video demonstrates the whole process, goes into great detail on how he designed and built it. And uh, this is a thing which he calls the Bruin Tosh. Kevin was prompted to undertake this project when he bought a broken Mac on eBay. And after assessing uh, what would be involved in repairing it, he decided to take a different approach. Now, this is a very relaxing video. He doesn't narrate it at all. It's just um, musical montages. As he works away, he measures, he designs, he prints, and he refines his Mac model. Uh, but there is text subtitles over the top of it, so uh, you can follow what he's doing, go to web links. You, you don't feel like you don't know what's going on at any point. So it's it's a, it's a nice, relaxing um, video. And actually having to see those subtitles makes you concentrate on it more. It's not just something you have on in the background. You, you, you focus in and, and watch the process. And it just it's a process that just gets better and better as the video goes on. 
Inside this, he's installed a working floppy drive, adapters to allow you to use the original keyboard and mouse, and they're lined up with the ports at the back, so it really does feel like you're just plugging in as normal. It's got a modern screen with a nice plastic bezel that overlays it to make it feel a bit more like a CRT. And while his intention was to use a Raspberry Pi as the guts of it, he said when he was building it, these were in short supply. So I think this is a build that's been going on for quite some time. You can see a lot of time and effort's gone into this, and now he's put the video together to show us. Because um, Pi's aren't in such short supply now, but they were when he was building it. So instead, he's repurposed a little thin client PC that cost him next to nothing. And it runs a Macintosh emulator called Mini V Mac. Now, it would be a disservice to call this thing a Hackintosh or just another 3D print pro project because of so much care and attention that's gone into it. He makes sure that everything is nicely mounted inside. Everything's got a place. It's, it's like it's all been designed to fit together perfectly. The 3D print itself, the case, it's, it's filled, it's smoothed, and it's got a finish that makes it, I would say, just like an injection molded case. It's a wonderful looking thing. And the end user experience when you sit down and use this thing just feels like the real thing, including putting the floppy disk in to boot it at the start. But the added extra, I guess a bit like the way you were talking about virtual pinball tables, is the added extra is you can press some kind of key combo or escape key, I'm sure, to bring up the options and tweak the emulator. You could give yourself the ultimate upgraded Macintosh of the era at no extra cost. Virtually slap some more RAM in there, put a better processor in there, a larger hard drive. You know, that's the beauty of this kind of project. It's it's the balance of experience, cost, um, and uh, dreams, I guess. You're living out living out that dream, using that machine that you saw in a magazine and, and could never afford back in the day. This is the sort of thing that brings it all together without feeling like you're just sitting at your modern PC with that dream machine in a window with Microsoft Word behind it or whatever else. It's, it's a really lovely project. Dave, I think it's a great project. I do want to talk to you about another project that involves 3D printing. And I'll tell you all about that in a minute, but let's just focus in on this first. Are you on board? I mean, you, it sounds like from earlier, you are on board with downloading your favorite micro and yeah. printing it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, should, I have to say this, that back in the day, the best Apple Mac was an Atari ST. Oh, come on. Um, I can't leave that out. Um, every single bit of the attack, Apple Mac spec was beaten by Travio's Jackintosh. Um, however, that's not the point these days. These days, we're not trying to get the most powerful computer we can. When you say every part of it, do you mean pound for pound per price? Yeah, I mean, the price so was half the price. It, it was higher spec. spec. Yeah. It was a higher resolution. It was a faster processor. It had better graphics hardware. It had more memory. It was just better in, in every single regard. The monitor was bigger. It was it just better in every single regard, and it wasn't an accident. Um, he had sat down and looked at the Apple Mac spec and thought, we can do better than that, cheaper than that, and that's what he did. Um, and that's why there was a, a market for Macintosh uh, emulators on it, which uh, were just a case of adding the ROMs in. Hang on. Let's not rewrite history. He looked at the Mac, he looked at the spec and thought, hmm, that high Toro computer, that looks really good. I'll buy that. And so he bought the Amiga. <laughs> he yeah. tried to buy the Amiga. And then he panicked and was like, oh, no, I haven't bought it. I've got to make something else. So he made the Atari ST. Is that, yeah. that, that, let's, let's not miss out that small detail, Dave. Yeah. Um, would it not have been better if he'd bought the Amiga? Um, the Atari Amiga. Let's not I, go down that rabbit hole because Duncan Dunkel will hit us if we have if we talk about it. I would genuinely have loved to see that thread of history yeah. and where it yeah. where it went with yeah. I, I I feel and this is controversial here that I feel that Commodore were perhaps poor stewards for the Amiga. Yeah, I don't argue with that. The this though, it doesn't need to be the most powerful computer. What it needs to be is the best one at being an old Apple Mac. And that's what matters. Um, it needs to do the job that it wants. It needs to be pleasant to use. But one of the most important things is that it looks and feels right to use. And that's why 
that that's the appeal here. Using an emulator is fine, but using this physical object is the important thing. And I'm not actually too bothered if something is a reproduction or if it is the real thing. And I know that other people are, are a quite different opinion there. But for me, there's actually advantages of having a reproduction over the real thing. And for some people, that's a hard no, but for me, it's not. Now, we talked about the Ultima reproduction boxes a few months ago. You've got Atari ST and you've got Ultima in your answer. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. We talked about the Ultima reproduction boxes and actually Matchstick Dragon came back to me yesterday to say he's been working on reproduction manuals for Ultima. What he's done is he's, he's it's not a case of scanning the PDF manuals in like you You've, you've sometimes got that when you buy a game from GOG, you'll get the scan PDF manuals are not so good. He's recreated the manuals to be as identical as possible by redoing the graphics, putting in the text, making sure all the, the, the layout's exactly right. And these are manuals with a lot of um, artwork, like line yeah. art and things like that. So yeah. that's going to take a lot of effort. Yeah. And he's got it complete to the point where he will soon be able to put these on a print-on-demand place where you'll be able to order a manual to be delivered to you. Now, to me, that's amazing. I hope it works out. Um, if you're playing these old RPGs, you need all the help you can get to fill in the imagination gap. And with a PDF manual on a different screen or having to alt tab for it. It doesn't cut it the same way. It helps a lot if you can hold it in your hand and be able to get them relatively inexpensively printed and sent to your house sounds great. And it might even be better than using a manual that's tatty and old and falling to bits with rust from the, from the, the staple and all the rest of it. And that's worth a fortune. I'm pulling the staples out of the manuals as I'm inventorying in the museum. And so many of them, uh, magazines and manuals, they're just brown. The staples are just brown and it's bleeding into the paper oh. and it's starting to damage them. So it's like, okay, let's put a stop to that. Um, and I'm also, <laughs> every time I do it, I'm like, I hope I don't stab myself with this crusty old brown staple. <laughs> I'll end up needing tetanus. to go down to the hospital for tetanus injection. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have to get a staple removal tool, really, to help with that. I do have a question, though. Yeah. Is there a place in the museum to have reproductions? Um, trying to think if we've got any in the museum at the moment in the cave. You do. Um, there's, one, there's one reproduction you have. You have a reproduction arcade cab. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, with a, with a multi-system in there. But... Um, it is funny that you should ask me that in a completely unprompted fashion, Dave, because it brings me on to the other project that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this is the very first time I can talk about this, because by the time this Week in Retro episode goes out, this this Week in Retro episode, um, this video will be live on the Arcade Archive YouTube channel. Okay, so I can talk about it. I can break cover at last. And there is a huge amount of effort going into this project. It's exciting. It is exciting. Should I tell you what it is? <laughs> Come on, know. tell me what it is. I, I, you, you, you let it slip. Um, and a few people have seen it already. I know that uh, Terrible Fire saw it. Yeah, you yeah, you'll see him appear in the video because he visited. So as you know, here at the Retro Collective at the Mill, we've got a 3D print farm. We've got a company called Heber and a man who works there called Richard, who is something of an expert on 3D printing. That's not doing them justice. He, he, he is not something of an expert. He <laughs> is an expert. He's literally written the book about it. He has actually he's just brought out the, a new edition of the 3D Printing for Dummies book. So yeah, yeah, so he is literally an expert, not something of. Um, we have an arcade museum here, and that word museum is important. So if you take a trip to any other museums, no matter how small or how prestigious, you will find reproduction artifacts. You'll find a plaster cast of a dinosaur bone. You'll find a recreated mask of Tutankhamun, for example. I did, in fact, work at a dinosaur museum when I was younger. I've mentioned this before. <laughs> and there were there were three museums in this kind of chain there was the dinosaur museum there was the teddy bear museum and there was the <laughs> tutankhamun museum <laughs> two out of three is not bad <laughs> and uh sometimes i would provide lunch cover so i would go from the dinosaur museum up to the tutankhamun museum to provide lunch cover so i would work in there too and people would genuinely regularly ask me is that the real death mask of tutankhamun in there 
and I'd have to say with a straight face, no, 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 no. The, the Cairo Museum in Egypt didn't decide the best place for Tutankhamun's death mask made of gold would be in the Dorset countryside. Um, it was just a convincing enough replica for people to look at it and go, is that the real thing? And that's his job. You know, its job is to be a talking point, to get people thinking about it and to discuss this thing in the context of everything around it. The same with a, a great big plaster cast thigh bone of a T-Rex or something like that. That's fine in a museum. So with this museum mindset, Richard set about, in secret at first, he didn't tell us until he was long into the process, he set about modeling and 3D printing a full-sized working replica of computer space, the first commercially um, available arcade video game. 19, and, 19 what? When was that? 19? Oh, well, Pong was 72. When was computer space? It must have been 71, 70. Yeah, it was in the, it was in the 70s. Um, 71. There we go, 1971. So uh, this was uh, Syzygy, wasn't it? It was Nolan Bushnell before they changed to Atari. Yep. Um, Ted Dabney. Ted Dabney. There you go. So we, Richard's... Um, using his his experience and it's it's quite a, a wavy organic shape this arcade cabinet yeah, it was made of fiberglass like, yeah duncan will put on an image of it but it looks like computer space looks like something out of star trek like literally out of out of the original series of star trek is that that aesthetic that that kind of is it is it fair to call it retro futurism now it wasn't retro futurism yeah, then so. Yeah, that, that's what it would be described as now, I guess, retrofuturism, what they thought the future would look like in the 60s. Yeah. So in the same way this guy's 3D printed in a, a new Apple Mac, Richard's taken it to a whole nother level and made a six-foot arcade machine 3D printed. And you're going to be able to watch right now, actually, if you go to YouTube and look for Arcade Archive, it'll be the latest video, and you can see the whole process. It's going to be a two-parter. So in the first part, you'll see it built, and you'll see the rough finish uh, and then in the next part we're gonna all get together sand it fill it give it that shiny fiberglass like finish but the electronics in it monitor crt in there it's just an incredible thing and like the tutankhamun's death mask you know i want people to come into the museum and say is that is that the real thing is that the real well hopefully no one would ever ask that because they'd look at it and go oh wow you've got a computer space but we would put information up there to say replica <laughs> yeah good. you do have you've got the sheriff and you've got original pong yeah so it's not it's not impossible for you to have the computer space there however i understand there's a lot more pong out there than there are computer space oh gosh yeah i think i saw a computer space go for auction a couple of weeks ago and it was something like eighty thousand dollars that isn't in our budget no, no, that that's the kind of thing that you would have someone, even someone lending that to, because they, they'll be fragile. These aren't these aren't these aren't straight up and down cabinets made of wood. They, these these are weird. Did you say fiberglass? It's fiberglass, yeah, yeah, fiberglass. Construction, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the detail Richard's gone to. He's even made the three D print so that it kind of looks like it wraps around roughly at the back onto a wooden board. Uh, like the fiberglass did on the original it's it's quite wonderful what he's done so uh, if you enjoyed this mac video or if you haven't seen this mac video go and watch it all the notes are in the show notes to to that um and also we'll put the computer space link in the show notes as well two wonderful videos in the name of preserving the experience of vintage computing and gaming if not the actual hardware and i think that's just as important as the hardware itself preserving that experience while we still remember what it was like and we can share that with people and pass that on to future generations. All the links are in the show notes. Let's go to the next story. Oh, it's housekeeping, Dave, and we haven't had a jingle. No, we're not going to have a jingle this week. We're going to miss out the housekeeping jingle, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Oh, you tease. I'd like to welcome our new patrons, Peter and Kevin. Thank you very much, Peter and Kevin, just Thank in you. time to get your your questions into the patrons Q&A, which has just opened up a couple of days ago um, at the time of recording. Um, patrons, go and submit your questions. Neil and I will answer them thoroughly. Um, even if you don't know the answer, we will, we will find it for you um, or make it up. Uh, we're not going to tell you which we'll do uh, go and submit your questions on the Patreon website for us, to us and we will get to those um, patreon.com forward slash this week in retro 
when we welcome in new patrons, we just say your first name. And that's why we didn't say what Chrissy's name was last week that we thought was amazing. But he's given us permission now. It's Chris Fury. Now, Fury's a great... Fury, Fury. yes. But sadly... Tyson. I know. Sadly, he wasn't born with that surname. It's just his DJ name. So DJ Chris Fury. He reminds us that he has a housekeeping jingle we haven't used yet. Don't worry, we will get to them all. And for anyone that has submitted one we haven't used, please do nag and remind us because it's possible that they get lost in the cracks. Um, He's also issued a challenge with a link to his YouTube channel in the show notes to find out what his real surname is. So at DJ Chris Fury on YouTube. It's not the question of the week, but do go work it out. Now, Neil, something wonderful has happened. (laughs) It has. And I... um, I'm not sure how to express it in words. Uh, thanks to Paul H for creating this. Um, and when he told us about it on Discord, I was utterly blown away. And Duncan, hardworking, industrious Duncan, spent, I think, his entire day on Saturday <laughs> doing this from an idea when I said, it'd be cool if you did this. And then Duncan's like, okay, a whole day spent on it. And then Duncan has done this. Neil, I, I, I don't know how to put it into words. Introduce what's going to happen. Tell tell people. Okay, so if you're listening on audio only, you might want to jump over to YouTube and, and have a look at the video version of this. Karaoke. We are going to have a karaoke sing-along with a, I don't think there's a bouncing ball, but the words will light up. Um, yes, they, 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 they'll, they'll, it'll spread across the words in time so you can sing just in time with it um it is the law to sing but if, if you don't um just enjoy this wonderful piece of this week in retro history let's go Dave's retro news briefs taking me back in time Dave's retro news briefs i'm catching that retro vibe Us up to date. Retro news
Okay. Um, I hope you all sang along to the very end. I like how it um, started whispering ultimate towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was that was the got the biggest laugh from me. Um, we might be talking about that again next week, mightn't we, Dave? Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, for a long time to come. Um, but yeah, we, we've we've learned some things um, in the process of that. that we're not song. sure what we've learned, but we'll, we'll talk about it next week. We'll yeah, find we'll out more. About, but that, that was yeah. absolutely incredible. I was so touched when I heard it. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll come back to I, that. And Neil's there as well. And I'm just happy to be there, just in the background. Yeah, yeah he's just there, Duncan lingering. Anyway, um, uh, let's get into this week's news in brief. Uh, we're, we're running long this week. We are running long. Right, let's go. Um, uh, Silopsium has released a uh, hasn't released has has put a post on the subreddit about <laughs> delisted music. Uh, Sorry, I'm just flustered by the song. Um, GOG have released a doco about the old games that they released being delisted because of the rights to the music in the games. The music rights um, are expiring, and this is likely to become more and more a problem. As games from the era of licensed music, I'm talking about games of the CD era, uh, and beyond that, that had the capacity to hold this kind of music. Well, these games are being released as retro games, but some of them are not now. Some of them are being pulled because... I'm sure back in the day, music copyright holders were far more savvy than video game publishers in this era, um, in this arena. And they obviously pinned things down to a time-limited usage of the music that was licensed. And I assume the only way around that would now to be pay more to license it again. But that doesn't make any financial sense for a limited release to a retro audience. So watch this space, I guess. More and more of a problem is going to be licensed music. There's so much more to say in that, but not today. Mm. Um, Wipeout is on 68k Amigas. So Fiskit um, has let us know about this. It's nearly ready. However, there's really silly specifications needed. So you need to have a super, super high-end Amiga. Um, it's a technical challenge to bring that to the Amiga rather than a game which is going to bring this to the Amiga masses. It's not going to bring this to the, the Amiga masses. You would need, I think you're going to need um, a, a, a Pi Storm at minimum to run this at any kind of frame rate, but it's cool that it's been done. Or Win UAE. I'm sure you can set the Win UAE specs to, to, to play it. Yeah. And you yeah. can't stick your nose up at that when we've just talked about the 3D printed Mac and emulation in that. If you've got no. a nicely emulated Amiga, go for it. Oh, yeah. If you've got a 3D printed Amiga, then yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the Trocadero, the center of the video games universe for a period. I took a pilgrimage there back in the day to play virtuality machines. Wonderful. Um, there are some new um, images of it uh, that have surfaced. Now, this is through theguardian.com. There's an article on the heyday of the Trocadero Center, and I got all nostalgic just reading through this article and seeing the pictures. There are pictures of virtuality kits in use, Um and there's a promotional video from 1996. Rows and rows of Daytona USA machines. Yeah. I only went to the Trocadero once because I lived in the Shire, but I made a pilgrimage specifically to go there, and I was not disappointed. So uh, if you want to go and have a read through, uh, the link is in the show notes. So thank you, Dr. Local. Um, a Zelda key glitch has been unlocked in detail so this is from uh, r retro hacking mod 2 and this is a new secret found in the 1986 game although i'm always slightly suspicious is this a new secret or is this someone claiming they found a new secret because it gets views i'm not sure i don't know enough about it to say it, it um, seems unlikely that there's secrets left in a game that old where people can fully disassemble it and pick through all the details hmm Lord Borax submits a story on time extension. It's all about the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester, which has moved to a new premises, and it looks shinier, cleaner, better than it ever has before. Uh, Andy leading the way there with his team, and, uh, well, leading on from the Trocadero story, they do have, I think, probably the only work in virtuality machines that you can actually have a go on that the full sitting machines as well as the stand up one with the gun where you can fight someone else across the room in the pterodactyl game um yeah so they've moved to new premises and if you've been before it's probably worth booking to go again and have a look around and if you haven't been look them up that's the retro computer museum in leicester 
Thank you, Lord Borak. Uh, thank you to our Retro Hacking Mod 2. A new project. Well, it's not a new project. It's... it's um, Get your mind up, Dave. It, it's <laughs> a new iteration of a project. Uh, it's a Sound Blaster emulator for DOS. It's called the SBEMU project. And the problem with using old, junk, obsolete PCs for doing DOS is they're great at it for everything apart from sounds. So you can get a PC that, maybe a Pentium 4, that's ready for the bin. Um, there's no one's got any use for. There's millions and millions and millions and millions of these around. Nobody really wants them. They're very inexpensive, and they'll do everything in DOS well apart from sound, which they'll do badly. And if you want to get a, an old DOS machine with an ISA, um, an ISA slot for an, and an ISA card, then it's expensive. Um, there are other options other than quite that, but no, there's no there's no cheap good option until now. So this is basically a driver for commonly found sound chips you'll get on these old, old obsolete uh, PCs, particularly integrated sound. And um, compatibility with this project wasn't great until around now, which is why Phil Phil's Computer Lab has made this new video. Um, so what they're doing here is a much better driver for DOS to do the emulation than the really ropey ones that we used to get. So when Windows 95, 98 came around, sound cards decided to cut back on costs and they dropped the DOS compatibility, which meant they were fine in Windows. But if you went to DOS, you could really really dodgy sound at times through emulation. For example, if you watch LGR's latest video, um, it shows really ropey sound in Duke 3D, for example. Um, now, this will be much better, and it will work in lots of games, as Phil shows, but several things didn't work. For example, uh, the game based on a, a popular type of tinned cat food that Neil's mentioned before. <laughs> Neil? Uh, tinned cat food? Yeah. Oh, go on. What are you? What are you? What is it? Salmon Max. Oh, for goodness' sake! <laughs> you deserve that. Say, I completely forgot about Salmon Max. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that this will improve over time, particularly if the project now gets a lot of people looking into it. I'll give it that burst it needs. And also, it looks like it runs on FreeDOS, which is really nice because FreeDOS yeah. is a, an open source version of DOS that's still updated, very much a current project. We'll work on modern hardware, so you can make your modern hardware a, you know, a bare metal, if you like, MS DOS machine. Yeah. Now yeah. with a, you know, a developing and, and good Sound Blaster support yeah. for modern yeah. cards. So, so that's really nice. Yeah. So this is great. The, the biggest hurdle of doing DOS games at the moment is the sound. But Jacko 6502 submits a story about someone at a flea market that just cannot give away copies of NBA 2019. Not surprised, really. Yeah, I mean, this this is the, the way that the NBA games and FIFA, and uh, although FIFA's now dead, and um, Football Manager works is it's the same game with just a few updates. You're paying for an update on it, and then the next year it comes out, and why would you go back a few years? Yeah. Well, this is an Xbox One game. They're sealed. There's a whole crate of them, and there's a sign that says, uh, NBA 2019, free, take them yeah. all. Yeah. No, nobody has. <laughs> yeah. There's loads, loads more in the subreddit. We seem to get busier every week with people submitting stories. It's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Neil, where should people go if they want to submit a story or see what's there or read the comments? Pop round Dave's house. He'll sit you yeah. in front of his PC, make you a cup of tea, and leave you to it. No, go to reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro, where you can read all the stories. You can take part in the question of the week, find the latest show and submit stories that you might like us to talk about and then pop round to Dave's. And by request, all the links are in the show notes for you. Duncan studiously puts them there. Now more than ever, we're seeing retro computers in film and TV. And two submissions this week, one about the new Ghostbusters film and the other about Halo, which apparently is a TV series. Um, in Ghostbusters, Venkman has a Commodore pet, and in Halo, there's a C64C, a Commodore C64C, plus a few other Commodores. Now, we saw C64s, I think they were, in John Wick, loads of stuff in Stranger Things. But the question I've got to work out between us today, Neil, is this. Are we seeing more of them, or am I just noticing it more? Are other people noticing it more and talking about it? 
or is mainstream media trying to ping those nostalgia buttons with its viewers by putting these stuff in? Or do they think it's a nice, easy way to get credibility for things by making them look authentic by chucking it in? What's going on, Neil? Mm, It's a conversation that comes up with every release of a new movie that just happens to show a bit of retro in there. It always comes up. Um, In something like Ghostbusters, where they know a large portion of the audience are going to be us, a demographic that will recognize a Commodore pet, for example, and, and it makes us feel smug about recognizing it. Um, that's that's fine. And from a storyline perspective, maybe Venkman was using a Commodore pet in 1984 when the first film came out. Um, I haven't seen this. Is it in use or is it covered in dust in the corner, do you know? It's on his shelf, I think. It's on his shelf. Oh, no, hang on. Someone said it's got color. It's got a color display on it, which the Commodore pet didn't do. So I don't know. I've not seen the film yet. I think I'm going to see it tomorrow, though. Okay, yeah, I need to watch that too. Um Halo, I don't know how a Commodore 64 fits into Halo because that's set in the future, isn't it? <laughs> this was on this was on shelves. That's the shelves imaging I saw. So I, I don't know. I don't watch it. I've not played the games really either. But um, th- this is on a shelf with various Commodore things on it. Okay. Okay. I'll have to reserve judgment until I see that one. I can talk about Ready Player One. Um, that was really the book and the film that did this in a big way in, in I say, recent years. It was some years ago now. But that whole thing was an exercise in getting the demographic to say, I remember that, that speaks to me, um, and then hooking them in in that way. And, and it's not surprising that others are, uh, are chucking in a slice of that into their own productions now. Um, it just it worked, and others are doing it too. I don't really see a big problem with it. Um, I would say it's a difficult time for a lot of people if we just zoom out a little bit. Life is, mm. life is pretty tough, cost of living, rising bills – politics which we don't get into in this show but there's a lot going on maybe next week we should do a politics special oh yeah politics special you can be the paxman of the show and um in that context (laughs) nostalgia is comforting we know that i mean when times are tough i'll fire up the a500 or the amstrad cpc it takes my mind off things for a spell and movie makers know this too it's all about feelings it's all about wrapping a warm nostalgic blanket around you and a glimpse of a Commodore pet, a glimpse of a Commodore 64, it does that, you know? And if you're sat in a movie theater being immersed in a film, I don't think that breaks the emotion. I think that Mm. sucks you in even further if you see something that triggers those nostalgic feelings. I think that's a good thing. I wonder if they've got a room full of this old stuff they just cart out and plop down on set, or do they borrow it from people? I know. Have, in you, the have you U- ever been asked? Uh, I have been asked, um, and I did lend some stuff to. Well, I lent some stuff to the Gadget Show some years back. I think it was uh, mm-hmm. for an anniversary of the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Um, I am aware that there is at least one company in the UK that specifically rents out retro kit. Ah. Um, so yeah, these things do exist. I don't know how big the market is for that, or isn't. But, yeah. Well, I certainly always smile when I see it, uh, especially if it's the stuff I used to have. So if I see an ST or a CPC, then that's what puts a big smile on my face. Does it annoy you when you see it being used or shown in the wrong way? A little bit. Yeah, and I'm... mostly they are being shown show in the wrong way. I know in John Wick they showed the keyboards that were using were Commodore 64s, but what they were doing was clearly something you, you couldn't do in it. Uh, I know that there was one, we we even talked about it on here, where they were showing an Amiga being used and it was PC stuff that was being done on it. And you think, well, why couldn't you just be authentic? It didn't make it, it wouldn't make it any 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 less any, any less good in the screen if you did authentic and it would look better. So it does slightly annoy me. I think what we need is a scene where in a movie someone sits down and starts using a uh, Amstrad CPC <laughs> I know you're going. <laughs> and is like, okay, let's hack into the system. And then the partner just produces a, an iPad and goes, just use this, you idiot, or something like that. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say when they sat down to play it and just said, read error B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call us if you want any screenwriting tips, Steven Spielberg. Time now for our community question of the week, which takes place on the subreddit, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. And this is the question from episode 163. And uh, the question was, what CRPG lit a fire under you in the way that Ultima 6 did for Neil? 
and Dungeon Master did for Dave. So this was off the back of that long CRPG discussion, um, off the back of the YouTube, the, the nearly three-hour YouTube episode about the history of CRPGs we discussed. Did you? Did you episode. have a chance to look at it yet? Uh, not yet, Dave. No, no. But I have been Talk reading... Talk to me when you do, because I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what you hear about Yeah, I'm going to. I have been reading the comments, though, on our subreddit, and a lot of people commented how much they enjoyed that discussion. It got a lot of um, people thinking and engaged uh, and talking about their own history, uh, and even more discussion in the question of the week. So have you taken it out of contest mode, Dave? Yes. Yes. I'm looking forward to these answers. There's some really juicy ones coming up. Okay, so I'll read the first one. It's from Lord yep. Borak 316 Controversial. You're going to hate, hate him. I already do. I can see what he says. Controversial. Ultima 8 Pagan. Ugh. Bear with me. I know this game is not well liked. This was the first game I played on my new 486DX after moving from Amiga. I was what totally blown away by the atmosphere of the game, the graphics, and especially the music. I preferred the screen angle of the game to Ultima 7, which I enjoyed playing on a friend's PC, but Pagan's game angle and movement just seemed better to me. I spent many late evenings drawing maps of the world, figuring out the spells and having to draw lines on the screen and spam saving to complete the pixel-perfect jumping sections. Yeah. I enjoyed playing the original release, which was broken so that it couldn't be completed which I didn't know until a friend gave me a patched version with easier jumping. And I finally, finally managed to complete and even managed to find a shortcut to the final world that I've never seen anyone else do. I still play it occasionally to this day. The music just gets me every time. Yes, I think Ultima 8 is the best Ultima. Banish me now. Mm. All right. Can we do an entire episode talking about it? So Ultima 8 isn't as bad as what people say it is. It was buggy on release. They did patch things out. They did make the jumping easier because jumping was didn't fit in with the whole Ultima game. And there was lots of good things about it. It was really atmospheric. But, 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 it's so distant from what I loved in Ultima 5 and 6 yeah. and 7 that it was such a departure from it. There was no party. There wasn't this massive world simulation going on. No, it, was it was a much smaller it world. It was quite a linear game where you just kind of yeah. travelled through the game, not around a world, and then there was that god-awful jumping. Jump, yeah, jump, jump. but it's it's not a bad game. Um, it's a good-looking it, game. It's a good yeah, it game. gets it gets a lot of criticism that's perhaps unfair if they'd maybe had three more months to finish it off, etc. But yeah, there you go, there you go. Take the next one, Dave. Richard Shears, who is uh, a gentleman, a scholar, because he's picked a great game, Dungeon Master. Having seen the review in ST and Amiga format, I was initially regretting my decision to purchase the Amiga instead of the ST. And painstaking year later, I finally got my hands on it and it didn't disappoint. So Dungeon Master sold apparently loads of STs because it took about 18 months after release to come out on the Amiga. So loads of people bought the ST just for it. Richard says, it was my first foray into the RPG world and really lit my imagination. The ultimate moment it led to was Skyrim. And, and that's, that's right. That this, 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 this is where these, these ended up. Um, despite its many flaws, Skyrim was the game I had been waiting for since Dungeon Master. My wife did comment that she was a Skyrim widow at the time. Anyway, now that I've taken an arrow to the knee, I'll shut up. <laughs> Next answer is from Tech Made Easy. He says, I came very late to the RPG scene. Fallout 3 was such an amazing game for me. Post-apocalyptic wasteland, strong lore, excellent plot, and Liam Neeson, who, of course, voiced um, James, the father of the Lone Wanderer. I have a special... No, I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> Freeing up enough high memory in MS-DOS is one of them. <laughs> There's loads of answers. Some of them are a few paragraphs long. Very interesting. Yeah, lots lots of things there. Well worth a read. Um, Pool of Radiance, Gateway, Gateway to the Savage Frontier. Now, that's an old one. That's a gold box game. Uh, Eye of the Beholder 1 and 2. Um, Star Trek Online, Horizon Zero Dawn, Elite Dangerous, Bard's Tale on the Atari ST. Mad Dog of... Williams on the ST. I've never heard of that one. Mad Dog Williams. No. Mm. Ultima 4. 
and Morrowind is in there as well. So lots of wonderful answers over on the subreddit. And that leads us to uh, our question of the week for this week, which is a nice, simple question. What is your go-to comforting bit of retro and why? This can be a game. It can be a productivity app. It could be something like Vista Pro where you just go and blissfully create worlds or a tracker, music creation. could be a piece of hardware. It's retro. It's comforting. What is it? Head to reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. Click on the question of the week and leave your comment about what soothes you and is retro. Dave, you're retro and you soothe me. Thank you very much, Neil. I hope you're soothed and for that little cold that you've got coming on. Yeah, I don't know if it's a cold or just overworking, so I'll take it easy today and we'll see how it goes. What are you doing today? Any oh. We're not finished. Normally, I ask you after we've finished recording. <laughs> you can ask me. What um, are you doing today, Neil? Well, I'm, I, I, I'm researching um, for my next video. Yeah, I won't ah. give it away. Um, researching. It goes, what am I going to do? Research it, script it, film it. So I'm, I'm at the sort of the, the initial seed stage of the next video. And then you go back and do the voiceover filming. <laughs> voiceover uh, and that's the point when the cold kicks in and i go oh for goodness sake i can't do the voiceover now and everything gets <laughs> held up <laughs> so thank you everyone for taking the time to listen uh, we really do appreciate your listens as always take a moment to subscribe or leave a review and uh, we'll see you next week it's time to wave dave i'm waving neil's waving, waving. bye guys thanks paul <laughs>community subreddit at r stroke this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show if you watch this week in retro on youtube please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers if you enjoy our show and would like to support it then please check out the link to our patreon page in the show notes or description thank you for listening and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech